Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This text is about the teaching of predestination or the doctrine of election. And the doctrine of election or predestination is, is really one of those teachings which people are often afraid to talk about. Uh, we often don't really know how to handle it in the church because it's a complex teaching. Uh, and it's one that Christians have disagreed about for a very, very long time. And so oftentimes in church, uh, maybe sometimes people just avoid talking about it because it's such a controversial issue. Uh, and there are specific denominations, specific church bodies that are largely defined by their view of this idea of predestination, their pr particular view of predestination. In fact, uh, within the Lutheran tradition, which I am a part of in America, there was a big divide over this issue, over uh, an understanding of exactly what this doctrine of election is all about. Well, when we look at the book of Ephesians, we look at this first chapter here, the, the doctrine of election is really not meant to be a divisive doctrine. It's not really meant to be a scary doctrine. If you look at the way that Paul presents it, he is using the doctrine of election or this idea of predestination really as something that encourages the Ephesians. He's using it as something to bless them. He's preaching sweet gospel to them. This is good news to the Ephesians. He says this, he says, He chose us in him, or in Christ, before the foundation of the world. He goes on to say, He destined us, or predestined in many translations, in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And so predestination or election is something that Paul uses to bless the church. He's trying to use this teaching to show the Ephesians something special about them that in fact salvation is not in their hands but God has it covered. He's trying to give them the hope and the assurance that God loved them even before the foundation of the world. Even before he created you, not even just before he created you, but before he created anything, before he created the entire cosmos, the entire universe, all things that exist, he was already thinking of you and he already chose you unto salvation. He chose you in his son, Jesus Christ. And so uh, sometimes the way that people explain this, this doctrine, it's, uh, it's explained in such a way that people are left to wonder, am I really elect? Am I one of the predestined? Am I one of the elect or am I not? And if you notice the way Paul deals with this here, he doesn't really leave a question. He just says, you are chosen in him. And so this is a message of assurance. We can have assurance that we are chosen in Christ because we belong to Christ. We can have assurance that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And ultimately, if we're looking to, for, for evidence of our election or of our predestination, if we're asking the question, am I elected to heaven? We ultimately need to look to Christ because this is why this is an election that is in Christ. And so if you're doubting your election, look to Christ because Christ is the one who came to die for your sins and you are chosen only in view of what Jesus did for you and you are chosen in Christ. And so if you are connected to Christ, you are part of God's elect. Now, there are a number of different passages that talk about this teaching of election. And as you look at some of these different passages, you begin to see why there's quite a bit of debate about this issue of election 
uh, or predestination. And just a quick word, I'm using uh, election and predestination um, synonymously in this context, but really they're, they're a little different because election specifically has to do uh, with the electing of individuals unto salvation, which results in their final salvation. And predestination is a little more broad term because God predestines more than just salvation. God predestines all sorts of things, like God predestined his son to come into this world to die for our sins. And so when I'm talking predestination here, I'm talking about the very specific context of predestining people unto salvation. Well, let's look at uh, a text that we used in our video on the Ordo Salutis to kind of go through some of the ways in which God saves us, some of the things that God does to assure that we are uh, in Christ and to assure that we are going to be with him in eternal glory. Now, one of those, those texts, the text that we looked at there was in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28. We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And then he goes on here, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, there's some debate here because this text says that predestination is based on something. It's based on something that is called foreknowledge. That's usually how this term is translated. And so what does it mean that God predestines us based on foreknowledge? Well, a lot of people when reading that particular text think, well, that means that God chose us in view of something that we would do. So, you know, think about foreknowledge. God looks through the corridors of time. He sees what's going to happen in the future. And so God watches to see what we're going to do, what decisions we're going to make. And then if he sees that we make the right decision, he says, well, I'm going to look ahead in time and I will see that, that you there, uh, that Joe, okay, looking at you, I see Joe, that you have chosen me. And now I am going to predestine you because I see, I foreknow that you are going to make the right decision. So now I'm going to predestine you to salvation. And so God's choice to save then is in some sense dependent upon what we as humans do. Is that really what Paul is saying here? Because salvation ultimately is not about us. It's about God and what he's done. And that's ultimately the comfort that he's giving the Ephesians. That's why he's using this, uh, this kind of language, because he's giving them assurance. It's not up to you. God has done it. God has taken care of it. He chose you even before the foundation of the world, before you could do anything, good or bad. He chose you. So I want to think about this word, foreknow. And I want to ask the question, does foreknow mean God foreknow something about you? Well, not exactly. Notice exactly, notice how this is worded. If God was foreknowing something about us, if he was foreknowing a decision that we were going to make, something that we were going to say or do or believe, then it would say, for those whom God foreknew would believe, or who God foreknew would do this, or would be uh, you know, more accepting of God's grace than someone else. But look at what it says. It says, for those whom he foreknew. He foreknew what did he foreknow? He didn't foreknow a thing. He foreknow new people. They are people whom he foreknew. And so he foreknows not something about people, but he foreknows those people who he will then predestine. So what does that mean? Well, this language of knowing is something that's used very, very commonly in Scripture. And uh, we understand in other texts that God knowing somebody doesn't really just mean he knows about something about somebody. So let's look at one text. Uh, let's go back to the Old Testament. We see this, uh, use this kind of idea throughout the Old Testament. We're going to look at uh, the book of Jeremiah. Uh, just look briefly at chapter 1. This is the call of Jeremiah. Okay, This is where Jeremiah receives his call from God that he is going to be a prophet of God. And he says this in Jeremiah 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And so God knew Jeremiah. God appointed Jeremiah to his particular purpose. And this is not that God knew something about Jeremiah, but before Jeremiah was even formed. And this is the same kind of language we see in, in Ephesians. Even before the world itself was formed, God foreknew Jeremiah. 
you know, Adam knew Eve, if we look at the book of Genesis. Does that mean Adam knew something about Eve? No, it, that's speaking of the, the sexual relationship and bond between the two of them. And so there's a connection between knowing and this, this relationship or love that we have for someone else. So God foreloved Jeremiah. He loved Jeremiah and set him apart for his purposes even before he was actually even created in the womb. And so a better way to understand this idea of foreknowing is to think about it as a foreloving. So God foreloves us. He knows us before. And it's not just that he knows something about us. Now, some people look at that and say, well, how does that make sense? Because if we look at... um, at this passage, doesn't it, if, if foreknowing means for love, and then predestining also kind of means for love, right? In some sense, he's he's choosing us uh, unto salvation. Isn't that kind of redundant for, for God to be saying those who I foreloved, I predestined? Because aren't they kind of the same thing? Well, notice what it says. It says those whom he foreloved, he predestined not just generally, but he predestined for a purpose. And he tells us what that purpose is in verse 29. To be conformed to the image of his son. So God predestines us for something. It's not just abstract, he chooses us, but he chooses us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. He chooses us to become more and more and more like Jesus until one day we are going to be with God in heaven in eternal glory, and we are also going to be on the renewed earth when Jesus returns, and on that day we are going to look a lot like him because we're going to be conformed to his image, our sin's going to be taken away, and we are going to reflect the glory of God. And so that's what we are predestined to. God predestines us to that particular purpose, and that is what Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 8. And I want to look at one other text just very quickly to get this point across even more, that we are not uh, predestined in view of something that we have done. We are not predestined in view of our faith, but we are predestined rather unto the faith that we receive. And this is from um, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Notice that one is first ordained unto eternal life, and then because of their ordination to eternal life, then they believe. He's not saying they were ordained to eternal life because they believe, but because they were ordained unto eternal life, they believed. And so God's ordination unto eternal life or God's election of grace is the cause of belief. And so the only reason we even believe at all is because it's a gift of God, because God has called us in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, there are some people who look at this teaching and think, well, what what is this saying? Okay, this is saying that God predestines people unto salvation. So if I'm saved, God predestines me. Okay, it's all God doing all the work bringing me to salvation. And then you get to the question of, well, what about those who aren't saved? And there are certain traditions, particularly those who are called Calvinists, the Calvinistic tradition, uh, or the the Reformed tradition. Uh, They teach that there is something called a double predestination. And so God elects people unto salvation, and in some sense, he also predestines people unto damnation, either by actively uh, damning them or by passively just passing them over and just not giving them grace. And so God says, I'm going to give grace to the elect, this group of people, but I'm not going to give it to this other group of people. And so then you ask the question, why are some saved and others not? And the Calvinists would say, well, I know that Scripture teaches that the only reason I'm saved is because of God's grace and God's determination. And so they think, well, you know, that must mean that if someone is not saved, that's also due to God's determination. So God predestines people to be saved, and he also predestines people to be damned. And that is not uh, what Scripture teaches. And so to hold to this idea that God predestines us for salvation does not necessarily mean we have to believe that God predestines people unto damnation. And so even hell itself, Scripture uses uh, you know, the terminology talking about hell, saying that hell was created for who? Was hell created for the reprobate, for those who are damned? Well, no, hell was created for the devil and his angels. People end up there, but it's never God's purpose that they end up there. And in other, another video, we'll be looking at some of the texts that talk about how universal God's grace is, that God's grace is for all people. Uh, we're going to do a, a, another one a video on the call, and this is where we'll look at some of these texts. Uh, but for now, we'll just say that Scripture teaches that if someone is not saved, that has nothing to do with God, it has everything to do with them rejecting God's grace.
And so that leaves us in kind of a, a dilemma, you know? So we don't necessarily know how all this works. I don't know how it makes sense that I'm saved by God's determination, but someone who's not saved is not at all saved by, or is not at all damned or rejected from grace by God's determination, but God desires for them to be saved too. Jesus died for them too. And I don't need to figure out all the answers to how these things work. And so when we look at scripture, uh, it tells us these two things, that when we are saved, it's solely God. God gets all the credit. But when we're not saved, it has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with sin, and it has everything to do with us. And so this teaching of predestination and election, don't be afraid of this teaching. Don't think this is something you have to stay away from, or don't think this is something that's going to cause you to doubt. Uh, because when you really understand what it's all about, predestination really helps us to understand the gospel even better. It helps us to understand the good news. It helps us to understand how God loves us personally and individually, and how God loves us so much that it's not just that he, that he loves us because of something that we did. It's not be, that he loves us because we decided for Christ, but he loves us so much that even before we were created or made any decision at all, he chose us. He chose us unto salvation. And so this, this idea of election is really good news. It's something that we can cling to in our times of, of doubt. It's something that we can cling to in our times of, of temptation and worry and fear uh, to look back and say, no, God has it all under control. God has chosen me unto salvation. It's not up to me. It's not up to me to bring myself into this faith or keep myself in the struggle. Uh, it's up to God. He's the one who brought me into faith, and he will complete me in that faith.